It's my great privilege to invite our speaker this morning, Naomi Whitaker. Uh, Naomi is uh, a member of St. Peter's. Uh, she's an audiologist at uh, the hospital at the Royal Sussex. And um, actually, she was our child's audiologist when we went there. And uh, she's got a great word for us. Let's give her another warm welcome as she speaks to us. Thank you so much. It is such a joy to be here with you guys. As Dan said, my name is Naomi. If I haven't met you, I would love to meet you, so come and say hi afterwards. I've actually only been at St. Peter's for about a year, but I absolutely love it, and it is a joy to be able to call it home. I absolutely love it. For those of you that don't know me, I work in a hospital, as Dan said. I'm an audiologist. Don't worry, no one knows what that means. You're not the only one. <laughs> An audiologist is someone who diagnoses and manages hearing loss. And then people say, why do you do such a niche job? And the, question, the answer is that God works through medicine and heals through medicine. And I want to be part of that. And that is it. It's such a joy. But enough about me. Today we are looking at the Lord of the Sabbath. What a topic. So let's just jump straight in and go to Mark 2 starting at verse 23. But let, let's pray first. Jesus, we thank you that you are the Lord of the Sabbath. You are Lord of all. And we just invite your Holy Spirit here. Pour out your spirit, Jesus. We want to see your name and your name only lifted high. Let these words be yours, not mine. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go to Mark 2. I think it'll be on the screen. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick up some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What a statement. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I also want to read a little bit from Exodus 20 where we find the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to read the fourth one. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I could just sit in that for days. There's so much in there. So I wonder if you can relate to this situation. The dreaded alarm goes off. The sun pierces into your eyes through your not-so-blackout blinds, and you regret every possible life decision that you've made up until this point and consider whether your job or education is even worth obtaining. You think back to when you were so desperately trying to fall asleep after 300 position changes, an hour of pretending to read a book, and a mental reenactment of every time you've ever applied you two to a waiter saying, enjoy your milk. Maybe it's just me. Or maybe you are a morning person and you can't wait until the spurts of glorious gold sunlight seep into your room and you're all snuggled up amongst a plethora of pillows ready for the day ahead. One alarm, two types of people. To be honest, I've never really been sure whether I'm an early bird or a night owl or just some sort of permanently exhausted pigeon somewhere in the midst. But either way, it's so easy to become fed up of turning off that alarm 
standing in line for your favorite seat on the bus. Just me that has a favorite seat on the bus, that's embarrassing. Repeating the same conversation with your colleague and doing it all over again the next day. Anyone else have days like this? So what is the point? What is the point if birth, education, and work are all that life is meant to be? Doesn't it seem so worthless? Do this, don't do that, say this, don't say that. Eat these green things, get those grades, pay these taxes, choose this career, recite those vows. Oh, and find yourself. Oh, my word. It is so hard. This is the question that has been raised in every generation and every decade. What is the point? And if you're doing Alpha or you've done Alpha, you'll know that week one has this question of, is there more to life? than this. We live in this fast-paced, consumer-driven world where it feels like everything goes 100 miles an hour 24-7, and it can be both overwhelming and exhilarating, but it's a culture of restlessness. We live in this culture where we don't rest. We have chronically unsatisfied desires. No matter how much we buy, we sell, we eat, we drink, it's not enough. We need more and more and more. And it's not surprising because we're designed to live with God, our satisfier for eternity. And so we're homesick. And I think we can often lack depth in our relationships and in our churches because we're hurrying. We're busy we're distracted, we're complacent, we don't know how to slow down. We live in this TikTok times, don't we, where our attention span is five seconds long or however long a TikTok video is, I don't even know. And I'm sure you've heard this this quote by Corrie ten Boom. It says, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Oof, that is heavy. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Both sin and busyness have the exact same effects. They cut off your connection to God, to others, and to your own soul. And yet, as we read, God gives us this beautiful gift of the Sabbath to stop, to cease, to slow down, to abide in him. What a gift that he wants to spend time with us, the creator of the universe, sees you and wants to spend time with you. No one is counted out. But we get overwhelmed, don't we? Because either we take on too much, I hold up my hands, that's me. Or we get overwhelmed because everything is a lot, but it's outside of our control. But either way, Jesus experienced this too. I spent some time in Asia with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And I remember walking into these temples where there'd be these big statues of different idols and gods, little Jesus. And they'd have their arms crossed and their legs folded, and they'd be sitting on these elaborate thrones distant from humanity. I remember just standing in these temples thinking, "This (laughs) this isn't the God for me. And I turned metaphorically in my head to Jesus, who is on the throne. And he's on the cross and his skin is shredded, his appearance is disfigured, and his soul is overwhelmed by our sin. He knows what it is to be overwhelmed. In Mark 14, we see Jesus in Gethsemane knowing that he's about to be arrested and crucified. And he says to the disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. I mean, I think I would be the same if I knew that I was about to be crucified. And he said, stay here and keep watch. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If that's you today and you feel like your soul is overwhelmed to the point of death, this is your creator saying, I get it. I'm not on some faraway throne. I'm here. I know what it is to be in your shoes. We don't Sabbath in order to be saved. We Sabbath in order to be refilled, refreshed, renewed, to hand over those feelings of being overwhelmed. We Sabbath to worship, to have 
moments of deep-rooted joy and peace to be reminded of what's to come. What a joy, what a gift. And as I said, I moved to Brighton in August last year, and I started off doing a five-day week, and as quickly as I could, dropped down to a four-day week, doing eight to a six. And I felt like I was just playing catch-up. It would get to the weekend, and then I'd do all those boring adulty things, like all the washing and the food shopping and all those fun things. And I was so unrested, and I couldn't figure out where I was going wrong. You know, I was doing my quiet times, I was leading into God, and I was like, I just don't get it. Like, I'm doing all the things that I think I should be doing, and yet I feel absolutely shattered. But then I realized that I wasn't taking the Sabbath. So I started taking the Sabbath, and I took it a whole lot more seriously, and I realized that I'd been missing out on one of the most life-giving practices of Jesus. But I felt guilty. I was like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> I've grown up in a house where my mum's favorite catchphrase is, just sit down. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> thanks for sharing. Like, she's, she's constantly on the go, and I love her to pieces, but my house, when I was growing up, did not rest. And so I felt this guilt of like, is it okay to suffer? I don't know, I don't know. And yet in Genesis 2, which we read, well, we didn't read, we we're going to read, it said God had finished the work he had been doing and he rested. He didn't need to rest. Why did he rest? Because we are meant to do as he does. He didn't need to rest. So I let go of the guilt. If God is allowed to rest, then I can rest. If God works, I'll work. And Dan gave me a really good way of defining Sabbath, so I'm going to steal that. Cheers, Dan. It is, Sabbath is 24 hours where nothing is urgent. Where we abide in his presence. Where we're fully available to our closest friends and family, but unavailable to the world. 24 hours. And I think we overcomplicate this. And I think it can be quite a foreign concept to our busy world. And even if you can't relate to that, that burnout or that exhaustion, Sabbath is still for you. It's not until you're at the point of breaking point. It's to prevent <laughs> breaking point, as I have learned. And I just want to recognize that the Sabbath um, has been interpreted differently by Christians, and that's great. Everyone has a different interpretation. Some Christians believe that we should no longer Sabbath because Jesus fulfilled that. We rest in him. And that's true. We do rest in Jesus. We're no longer under the Torah, but it's a gift. And we see that Jesus Sabbaths. He gives, he gives it as a beautiful gift. I don't think God really cares about what day we choose to rest. It's about the fact that we are entering his rest. What a joy. Hebrews 4 in the New Testament says, the promise of entering his rest still stands. I love that thing of like, I'm entering his rest and exiting from the world for these 24 hours and just being with him and those I hold dear. So if you're thinking about giving Sabbath a go, I can't persuade you enough. It has changed my life. And I know 24 hours can feel quite overwhelming. You're like, oh gosh, I've got a whole to-do list. And I recognize that I don't have children or many other big responsibilities that you guys have. But if 24 hours is too hard, start off with an afternoon or a morning. If that's too much, start off with an hour. God just is so desperate to be with you and spend time with you. He just wants to abide with you. And I remember the first time I took a Sabbath, I was rubbish at it. <laughs> I was so like irritated and distracted and just couldn't figure out how to do this. <laughs> and yet Jesus has a whole lot of grace for us that I don't have for myself. We just want to sit in his throne room of rest. The most important thing, though, is that we keep it holy. It's relational. It's not meant to be legalistic. If your kid manages to chop his finger off, take him to a and &E. It's not like, oh, no, hang on a minute, I'm on my Sabbath. No, no, <laughs> rest in him, but also let's have some common sense. <laughs> and in the Mark passage that we were looking at, this is exactly what happens. The disciples are plucking corn on their way to church, as you do. Don't know about you, but I plucked corn on my way to church today. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come along and they're like, finally, we've caught this guy, Jesus, actually committing 
a sin, we can finally arrest him for something. And he's like, hang on a minute, who's committing a sin? I can't see anyone committing a sin. The Pharisees make it legalistic and take away what it was intended for. The disciples were so focused on getting to church and abiding in God that they forgot about breakfast. (laughs) And the Pharisees are like, you sinners. (laughs) I mean, I forget breakfast all the time. It's just about having that motive of being ready to abide in him. So I think we can overcomplicate it and be like, hang on a minute, so how does this work? What can I do and what can't I do on the Sabbath? And it's not even about what I can and can't do. It's about what are the things that make you rest in God and in others. And to do that, I tend to ask myself two questions. The first is, does this thing bring me closer to Jesus and to others? And the second is, does it fill my cup rather than empty it? Does it bring me closer to God and does it fill my cup? If it doesn't, that's not for your Sabbath. And I'm just going to put it out there. Sabbath doesn't have to be boring. (laughs) You don't have to be sitting in the corner of a room in the dark just repeating the Ten Commandments over and over again. But if that's you, go for it. No one's going to stop you. (laughs) It's meant to be a celebration. It's meant to be joyful. It is meant to be so much fun just being with our maker, with our creator, with the one who knows us best. So it's for rest. We know that. But it's also for resistance. Sabbath is resistance. Because in this 100 mile an hour, 24-7 world, rest is so countercultural. It literally just doesn't exist. I remember when I was like (laughs) begging my boss to let me drop down to four days. He was like, I just don't get it. Like, you're young, you know, you should be like working all the time and things. And I'm like, I really don't think I should. I'm pretty sure the Bible says that we should rest in him. And it really did make me (laughs) feel like a whole different person just resting in him. I think when we choose to Sabbath, it demonstrates our resistance to this fast paced culture and shows our priority of choosing Jesus against the world's call. I don't think we realize how countercultural that is. And I think the longer I've been a Christian, the more I've realized that actually the the maturing Christians, there's no such thing as a mature Christian, but the maturing, the most maturing Christians aren't those who work the hardest or attend the most services or part of the most church teams, or even the biggest tithers. They're the ones who are resting in him best. Not even necessarily about the amount of time we spend with Jesus, but how vulnerable we are with him, how open, how honest we are. In the passage, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. He proclaims himself as being so much bigger than the laws that the Pharisees manipulated. He proclaims himself as the one and only God that exists and the only one who has defeated death. I think we take that for granted. I don't know about you, but we have defeated death through Jesus. We are saved into his kingdom. And that kingdom isn't one of rushing of hurrying, of walking on eggshells, of anxiety, of fear. It's one of divine depth, of joy, of satisfaction, no longer wanting for more, of perfection, of slowness. One where he says, I have made all things new. But eternity starts now. (laughs) We don't have to wait until eternity comes. Eternity starts now. Now, if you're yearning for his kingdom to come on earth, as we should be, take the Sabbath. They're the moments when you see heaven come down. And he likewise is yearning. He's there with his arms open wide saying, come into my presence. Be with me. I honestly can't persuade you (laughs) to do this enough. Like, I... I remember the first time, after the first time that I didn't do it very well, the next time I was like, right, okay, I'm going to start on the Thursday night because it's meant to be a communal thing. You're meant to start off with a meal with your community and then do the day and then end with the night of the next day. But you can do it however you like. 
But I remember just being like, yeah, I'm in his rhythm. And what a difference that makes. We, we have so much pride. I have so much pride where I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I've got this under control. And then all of a sudden, I'm burned out and I'm exhausted and I'm like, what's happening here? And it's because I haven't Sabbath well. So I'd love to invite the band back up. And I'm going to read one of my favorite passages that I tend to read at the beginning and at the end of my Sabbaths. It hasn't really got any link, to be honest. It's just one of my favorite passages, and I just love it. <laughs> and it's, it was just like, for me, it was a completeness of being like, here is a practice that I have of reading the same passage at the beginning and at the end. And it's often a different one, and I love it. It's Revelation 7, chapter 7, starting at verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Blessing and glory and honour and wisdom and thanksgiving and power and might be to our God forever and ever.